Well, thank you. Good morning or uh, afternoon. Uh, well, let's start with uh, some questions just to have a general idea. How many of you work with uh, microservices right now? Wow, it's quite a lot. Now, from those people, how many of you believe that you work the right way with microservices? Again, raise your hand. <laughs> oh, wow. It's a bit sad, but uh, okay, it's fine. Now, how many of you are still working with a monolith? Okay, yeah, like the other half. And now, how many of you are happy with that monolith? It's uh, more or less okay, maintainable. Mm, minority, yeah? Okay, it's fine. Well, it was uh, interesting, by the way. So today, I'm going to talk about the six pitfalls of moving to a microservices architecture and how to avoid them. So I would try also to provide some uh, advice based on uh, my experience. So my story is that four years ago, I moved to the Netherlands, to Amsterdam, not because of the uh, coffee shops or not because of the weather or the food. But by the way, any Dutch uh, people here? OK, yeah. It's not the weather, not the food, but uh, I, I like the country. Yeah? I love uh, going my bike to, to everywhere. And uh, well, I moved there because of the project. I was uh, offered a position in which it was quite challenging because uh, yeah, we had a chaotic monolith, a huge one, and then we were trying to move to microservices. And how everything was uh, set up, so for you to have an idea of this project, which was my first job in the Netherlands, we were planning to start from scratch because we didn't believe that we could refactor the existing monolith into microservices. We believed that that would be very difficult. We also got uh, approval to, to start from scratch. Uh, we were planning not only to have the same functionalities that the monolith uh, have, but make it more scalable, but also the business people, they decided to push a lot of new features on top of that, also from scratch. Uh, and on the human side, the, uh, yeah, everybody was tired of all the monolith uh, limitations, so everybody was looking forward to working with monolith with uh, microservices. The, there was a small issue that almost nobody had experience in a practical way working with microservices, only from books and uh, articles on the internet. And there was also another small challenge that it was everybody was moving from the monolith to work on the microservices from day zero. So 25 developers the, uh, in five teams, each team with one product owner, and only one guy setting up the infrastructure and operations. And I'm here during this presentation, you will hear me like almost ranting about what happened there and, uh, and how we managed to solve that. But when I'm uh, talking about the people that were, was involved there and how they uh, reacted to, to these different challenges. I'm also blaming myself. So this is a big disclaimer here because I was appointed there as a solutions architect. And then you can imagine that many of these mistakes, they were actually on me. So I will share with you how did uh, go. But Let's say that given the, this uh, scenario, moving from a monolith to microservices, from a scratch, having some nice features, a lot of uh, people that can work and uh, can make this happen, it looks uh, good, right? So basically, what could possibly go wrong here? It's a perfect plan, a lot of uh, good intentions, but sometimes things are not going as expected. So I will go through these uh, six uh, pitfalls that we found on our way, and also will give you some uh, advice, things that worked for us. So the first one is the Agile trap. So I'm quite sure that many of you work uh, with Agile. Uh, Agile is saying basically that you should deliver as soon as possible to your users so they can try what you are doing, and then you can get feedback from that, and then you build on top of that. However, when you do microservices, doing this is uh, very challenging because you need some foundations, some what I call technical epics, that they basically need to be there, at least in a bare minimum, so you can build on top of that. 
And then our fault was that we were trying to do this in an agile way. And then we made some concessions and we say, ah, okay, maybe we can uh, be like two, three sprints without centralized logging or without a gateway that can route traffic to the different microservices. And then that was chaos because basically nobody knew how they could try their services with other people's services. So yeah, it was a, a bit of a messy scenario. So you have to think about all this load balancing, service discovery, gateway, messaging, if you are going to use Kafka, RabbitMQ, whatever, decentralized logging. You want to make sure that all microservices, they work together, they integrate properly. You may want to use Docker for containerized or uh, Kubernetes that will also provide some of these patterns. You want to do continuous integration, and most likely you want to do continuous uh, deployment as well. So many things to do, and it's very difficult to, to do that in an agile way from the beginning. So what's my advice here? How can you deal with it? The first thing that I recommend is that you prepare a list with all these technical epics, because one of our main reasons why we failed here is that we were not making visible to everybody, to the business people, management, that there were some things that we would need, and that they were planning the roadmap without taking into account these uh, basic foundations of the project. So make it visible if you have a wall, so you can make it physically visible, just hand them on the wall so it's, yeah, everybody will look at them every day and they will remember that that needs to be done. Also, if you can, and I recommend you to do that, is that you can do something like a sprint zero or something like that, that they can take two or four weeks, whatever you need to build, not everything, of course, but just the foundations, the minimum things that you are going to, to need here. And that will be great, because then everybody will be able to deploy, check the logs, and everything. If you can, because this, is, uh, this might be expensive, you can also try at the beginning to go for a platform as a service instead of going infrastructure as a service, which could be like just deploying containers on Amazon. So I'm talking about things like uh, Google App Engine or uh, Heroku or uh, Pivotal Cloud Foundry. So there are some platforms that allow you to just push your code there and then all these technical infrastructure things, of course you have to learn how that platform works but it's much less effort than building all this yourself. Then later, if you want to save uh, money, of course, because they are very expensive, you can build that yourself. And then this first pitfall, it's also a good test to check how prepared is your organization to move forward with microservices. Because when you are having this challenge and you're talking to business people, and uh, yeah, basically the product owners, the management uh, organization, you can see if you have support from them to do this. It's not only that the technical people want to go there, it should be an organization uh, movement. So if you see that these technical epics are just uh, underestimated or they are just trying to push them forward, then your organization is not supporting moving to microservices. You might want to talk with them about the advantages of going there, why you think it's a good idea, and try to convince them before you do this movement like in a forced way, because that, uh, yeah, that's very difficult that that will work. So let's go to the second pitfall, is the Conway's Law hackers. So the Conway's Law, it's, I, I will try to summarize it in uh, my way for those uh, that don't know what I'm talking about. The Conway's Law says that the organization, the structure of your organization, how your teams are uh, set up, those will impact the software that you're building. And this is somehow proven that uh, the way they communicate and the way they are grouped, you will produce a software that is, let's say, mapping your organization. So in this example, these two teams are producing two boxes of software. I'm not talking here about monolith or microservices, but it could be whatever. But you could see that in these two parts of your uh, system, there is consistency between these, uh, within these boxes, but not 
between them. You see like they, there are many differences in code or they are not, uh, the interfaces are not uh, well designed. So this is something that happens. So because this happens, you can take advantage and you can say, mm, what I can do if I want this architecture, if I want these three boxes because I'm starting from scratch and I'm doing uh, microservices, I can design my whole microservices uh, map and then I can structure my organization in a way that follows that map. Then, because I know that the Conway's law is going to, to uh, happen, then I will produce the perfect architecture. So that's, uh, yeah, that's a perfect plan. This is called reverse Conway, by the way. I'm not saying that this is not working, so the, this can, you can benefit from that. But what happened in our case is that we didn't uh, take into account that you cannot do that at the beginning and then just forget about this. Because uh, what happened at the beginning is that there were some services designed there. Of course, those services that we designed were not the ones that we were uh, needing finally. So we needed to make some modifications on the way. And that's fine. But the problem is that the uh, organization had an idea of allocating budgets to teams, which is the same as allocating budget to microservices. And then when people needed to move around because some other service would need more functionalities, they couldn't because it was too strictly made at the beginning. So that was a pitfall that we uh, encountered. So how to deal with this? Well, as you can imagine, if you apply reverse Conway, just try to be flexible, you can change ownership of microservices. That shouldn't be a problem. So if you see that a team is uh, not being able to cope with all that work, there shouldn't be a problem that other team is taking the ownership of that uh, microservice. More than focusing on how to structure your team, what I saw that work uh, better is when your teams are communicating fluently with each other. Just sitting on a meeting room, and then if you have a specific user flow and you know that you're going to need work in multiple microservices, it's quite nice when people get together and they get a whiteboard and they draw, OK, what is uh, the interface that we are going to need here? Should I send an event or should I call a REST API? Whatever. You just talk to each other, define these contracts, and then you go back to your team and you work on that, but having a clear interface from the beginning. And if you can, and this is something that, uh, of course, project managers, not everybody understand this, when you start with microservices, I think it's even more important that you start with a, only one team and as small as you can, like uh, seven people or six to eight. Because at the beginning, when you are starting, if you start from scratch, you will need to talk to each other a lot because you need to define the boundaries, what are going to be the interfaces. And if you have people that are working separate from each other, yeah, there are a lot of uh, possibilities that they will build just isolated things that they are not talking to each other at all. Now, the third uh, pitfall is a book reading cult. So, who are these book reading cults? Well, the book reading cult are a group of people that they read books. They read a lot of articles on the internet about microservices. And then they become evangelists, advocates, prophets about uh, microservices. And this happens uh, a lot, I don't know why. And it's uh, very dangerous when these people are also integrated in high layers in your organization. That's even more challenging to, to deal with. So in our case, the, the problem was basically that we were wasting a lot of time in meetings, to, to uh, be clear. Because there were a lot of people talking about uh, from the day zero without having any code at all event source and uh, domain-driven design, that's all, okay, that's fine, because we should, of course, try to do some, uh, some good practices. But there were some technologies and patterns that they didn't apply to our use case. So they are very good for maybe Uber, Netflix, or Amazon, but we were not building uh, 
an online shop. So yeah, we don't need to do necessarily everything that is uh, on the book. And this is, by the way, something uh, funny because it, it only happens in the technology, I think, because imagine that you want to lose weight or you want to become a, a stronger or top et al, like we say in Malaga. <laughs> and uh, then you want to be a top et al or a strong, and then you read the book and you are giving advice to others about how to become a top et al. That doesn't happen, right? <laughs> People will look at you and say, what are you talking about? You, you are not practicing. So you need to go out and just do some practice. So the same thing that happens with those books, you should do that with the technology books as well. If you read the perfect book about how to build perfect microservices, just try to map those concepts to your business case. So if you are building a different software from the one that is uh, in the book samples, just try to put that into practice, and you will see which patterns are good for you or which patterns are not good for you or maybe too difficult to do at the beginning. So this is also like an advice that is everywhere, but we tend to forget about it, is don't be attached to the code. You are building microservices, so if you define good contracts or good interfaces in your microservices, it should be possible to get rid of one entirely and then build another one that does the same thing but with better code quality and better patterns. So it's better if you adopt evolutionary software instead of trying to create the perfect microservice from the beginning because that will take you a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of uh, meetings, and it's very difficult. It's better if you try to experiment. So don't feel attached to code, experiment, do continuous improvements. Uh, something that we, yeah, something that happens as well, and I, I have experienced that as well, is that if you put this first implementation there on production and that works, then it's very difficult to evolve that implementation because uh, there are many managers that will say, oh, that's working, don't touch it. It's why, why do you want to touch it again? It's working, it's fine. But uh, maybe you want to touch it because it's not scalable and you want to make it more performing because you know that you are having a bottleneck there and it's not going to work out. So in order to solve that, use the same wall that you were using before and create a stage two epics for that. So if you're building a microservice and you know that you could use some event-driven patterns or some event sourcing, just create an epic to experiment with that in a microservice and just try to get that done. But if you make it visible and you make the advantages visible, it's much easier to make it happen. For the next pitfall, the never decouple enough story, I will give you an example. So in this example, the contract sign flow, let's say that you are trying to uh, sign a contract for an internet provider, and then you are happy with the contract, you press the button, so you are actually going to pay money for that contract because you will get that service. So you sign the contract digitally, then we are going to generate the first invoice, and we are going to send an email with that invoice. And then some people, smart people, they go into a room and they say, okay, let's design how we are going to do this with microservices. I'm not saying that this is the right way to do that, but imagine that those people design that, and that there is a contract service, invoices, emailing, and users. And then the first day, you go there, and say, okay, let's try to design how is this going to be this uh, flow. And actually, the contract service is going to call the invoice service and saying, generate the invoice, and we are going to uh, create a REST API. Invoice uh, service needs the address, so it will go to the user service and say, give me the address because I need to print it uh, on the invoice. Then it will instruct the email service to send an email, and then the email service, well, it, it's missing an arrow here, but it will go to the user service, it will get the email from that user, and then it will send the email. So please don't do that, because you are actually coupling all your system together, and you have uh, real-time dependencies between all your services. So if the invoice service goes down, then your system is not going to work, because it needs to be there when the contract service is going to call that service. So that doesn't work, we go a second day, and. We say, okay, we uh, think that we have a better way to do this. Let's send some events. 
Then the contract service is going to send an event, contract sign. The invoice service will consume that event whenever that service is ready. And this is still contacting the user service to get the address in a synchronous way. But then there is another change here is going to send an invoice ready event with the invoice. And then the email service, whenever that service is ready, will consume the event, will get the user email from the user service, and then the email is sent. So more or less, we improved uh, something, right? But you might have some people from the book reading cult in that meeting. And yeah, don't do that, because you still have some synchronous calls. So how can we fix it? Oh, I read a book. I think we should do domain-driven uh, design. Let's copy data from services from uh, the user service into all those uh, other services. Because if they need information, it's fine if they have that partial information there. So why not copy in the user addresses in the invoice service and the user emails in the email service? And then before this flow starts, you can have the user service sending user updated events to whoever is interested. Then you copy the data that you need. And then this flow can work without any kind of synchronous interaction. Then you get the email, and you send it. So yeah, congratulations. You got like uh, to the perfect final situation in which you want to be. However, if you're building this service from scratch, take into account that those information parts that you are replicating in those services, you need to keep them in sync, which is quite challenging. And it can bring some other problems, like events that are lost and this uh, kind of stuff. So the question is sometimes, if we are starting to build this uh, microservices uh, system, isn't this good enough? Can we leave at the beginning with this and then later try to decouple of the relationships with the user service? And then, of course, I'm being a bit controversial here, but I would say, yes, it's fine as long as you know that you want to remove that bottleneck or that potential bottleneck with the user service, if that ever comes a bottleneck. So what happened to us, like the problem that we had here, is that we didn't have four services. We have like 30 from the beginning, because we were starting from scratch. And the problem is that we needed to replicate information everywhere, and uh, we couldn't cope with that amount of design. We couldn't start because we were blocked in conversations about copying data from one place to other and about how evil it is to have synchronous calls between services. So how to deal with this? Well, my recommendation is that you should know all these practices uh, in advance, domain-driven design, event-driven patterns. But try not making a drama of having synchronous calls between the services. To avoid like building a spaghetti system, what you can do is you can create a microservices map. And the Microservices map is just a uh, what I showed just before, like the four boxes with the arrows uh, between them. But yeah, you don't need Obama or the monsters there. You just need the boxes and the arrows. And then every now and then, you see it in front of the map. You can also hand it uh, on the wall that you have. And you can think, OK, are we building an OK-ish uh, system? Or are we having all kind of arrows flow into the same box, and then this is becoming not maintainable at all. And you should be able to distinguish that and then react and even question yourself, why, we, why did we go for microservices if we are not designing our domain in a proper way? Because we have too much blocking uh, calls between them. So try to make it uh, visible again. The common patterns phobia is the fifth uh, pitfall. And as the joker said, Introduce a little anarchy, upset the established order, and everything becomes chaos. Am I saying that microservices are uh, anarchy? Not necessarily, but they can be, right? So uh, yeah, let me talk about the freedom of choice here. 
So in our case, we had a monolith that was uh, Java 8, REST APIs, Spring, and MySQL. And some of you might be thinking, wow, you were lucky. At, uh, at least it was uh, more or less okay, uh, monolith. Anyway, we couldn't work with that, so we decided to move uh, to microservices. And there was something here that we missed on the way, that it was that in the monolith there were some rules, even though we couldn't notice those rules, because they are implicit to the monolith. I couldn't wake up one day and say to my team uh, colleagues, hey, I think that for this feature it would be perfect if we do Python with a GraphQL interface and then uh, this other database, and then people would freak out and panic and say, well, what are you talking about? How are you going to deploy that? How are you going to build this? It's uh, impossible in our system. So the rules are there, but we don't see them. When you move to microservices, yeah, you can do whatever you want, basically, in, in, inside a microservice, as long as you have an interface that is clear to other services. So you could basically do one with the Scala, the other one with Python, and uh, yeah, you, you name it. But the fact that you can do that doesn't mean that you have to do that. So what we did in our organization is that we believed at the beginning that there were some patterns that could benefit from having a common technology stack. And we thought of uh, mainly two, authorization, because we were distributing some tokens and then doing some uh, permission uh, filtering. And we also had distributed tracing, so we wanted to use a Spring, and that was yeah, somehow coupled to Java. So we decided to have a common technology stack, and then the problem here was that everybody became very upset. And then everybody became uh, very angry and passionate about, oh, wow, but microservices are about independency for the teams to build whatever technology stack they want to build, as long as the technology, as long as the interfaces are clear, and this and that. And then again, we got a lot of uh, frustration. So that was a problem in, in this project. And how to deal with it? Because we failed at this, but I'm trying to give some advice. Because by the way, I've seen this uh, working in other companies. So what you can do is I'm not telling you to do uh, anarchy or full rules written on a song. Yes, make it clear from the beginning. So you need to tell everybody if there is total freedom for them to do whatever they want, or if there are some rules that you cannot escape, or even if you are going to build a common shared library that is a very uh, flaky topic, but it, it could be that you believe that that would work in your case. But whatever you do, just explain it and what are the advantages that you think that you are going to get uh, with that. Also, when you're working with microservices, if you are free to pick a new technology or library, uh, get some consensus. So don't make a one-man decision there that can just pick whatever technology or uh, library they want. Just sit with some senior people and check with them, is this a good idea or not? Could be useful for you or, or not? So we can share some knowledge and people might have better ideas than that person trying to choose uh, individually a technology. So get some consensus when you do that. And this might be like the, uh, from my opinion, the most useful advice of this talk is that whenever you do a decision, just write it down. Because uh, I'm a person that is uh, tending to forget everything after two months, but I saw in my experience that there are some other people that they do the same. So if you go to a meeting and you say, let's build this microservices in Scala do with this database, just write it down. And it's very easy to write that down. You just need to write who participated in that decision, what was the outcome, so what is the decision, and what, was, what were the constraints, which are very useful because you can understand in six months why you picked that technology. It might be because of time or it might be also because of uh, money. So you cannot buy a license for some library. So you just write that down 
and then you will be able in future to reconsider if that was a good decision or, or not, based on the constraints that you have and the new situation. So you have an example of that in that uh, link. I will share it later uh, anyway. But these are the architecture decision records. I didn't invent that. that was, uh, there is already a format uh, for that. And the last uh, pitfall is the buzzword syndrome, which is related to some of the things that I've uh, been talking before. So some words, they sound very cool, and then people tend to absorb them and just throw them in uh, meetings or in design sessions because they make you look uh, smarter sometimes. So it happens. Eh? I, I, I've done that. So there are a lot of words like that. One is, of course, microservices. Even it's, it's old, but it's still a buzzword. Event-driven architecture, reactive programming, serverless or lambdas. Everybody wants to, to go for lambdas. Blockchain, yeah, because why not? Uh, Internet of Things, DevOps, big data, which is an old one, but it's still there, right? Some people say, I have a four gigabyte uh, PostgreSQL. Why not doing big data? Yeah, why not? And a new one that I really like, because this one is funny for me, is Modulith, which is like an, a shorter version of a modular monolith. And this is funny because it's like the microservices have been there for a while, and then people are already regretting of having gone to microservices, and they want to go for the monolith. And that's happening. Yeah? But they don't want to see that they want to go for the monolith. So what they do is they call it a monolith because everybody has good intentions, right? So then you say, no, I will do that modular, and I have this library that will help me do the monolith in a right way. Yeah, of course you will. But uh, yeah, that, so the problem we had in, in this project is that uh, people were throwing these uh, words in meetings because we were starting from scratch and there was uh, the opportunity to do this. But that would also bring us a bit uh, slower than we were expecting because uh, there were too many things that we wanted to try and actually not many of them were applicable to our case, or they could be applicable, but not at that given stage, not from the beginning. So I'm not saying that these things are all like uh, useless, of course not. They are very useful, but at a given time in your project, and also if they make sense for your project, which is very obvious, but yeah, we tend to forget about that. How to deal with it? Well, if you are the one throwing these buzzwords, yes, Try to content yourself a, a bit, and if, try to read first if they are uh, useful for your use case. Be critical, pragmatic, and realistic. And sometimes what can also happen is that that person is trying to sell you something. So there might be a blockchain evangelist in your company, and that person is trying to bring blockchain to the company for some dark reason. but yeah, maybe you don't need blockchain. You are fine uh, without. But, or maybe you want to say in your portfolio that you're doing uh, blockchain. That might be another reason. Uh, for that person coming up with that buzzword, it's very useful if in that meeting you try to uh, block that a bit, and then you challenge them to come up with a plan for that. So OK, you want to use blockchain. Can you tell me how we could use blockchain in our scenario, you can do that offline, make a plan, and you don't need to write a lot about that, just write a draft plan on how we can move to this in, from our current uh, situation. And of course, there should always be a reason, and remember to write that reason down. So if you go for reactive programming because you believe that that's the way that programming is uh, going, and it's because you and your team, you want to learn that thing, you can do that. that that's, there is nothing bad uh, with that. But just write that down, that that's the reason why you want to go for reactive programming in one specific microservice. So that will help you understand later why you made those uh, reasons. So to wrap uh, up after the six pitfalls, 
microservices are not the solution to all your problems. So some people believe that if there are organization problems like not having enough time to build the proper software quality, with microservices it's going to be easier. That's not really true. You can make a much bigger mess with microservices than with a monolith. So they are not the solution to all the problems. If you can, just start with a small team. As I said, it's much easier to communicate to each other and to design the microservices in the proper way. Make your plan, your guidelines, and your decisions visible to everybody. If you can use a wall, just use it, whiteboard, or if you can keep them like in a version control system like Git, just make sure of sending the links as often as you can so everybody can see what are the decisions that are being made in your company, what is the plan, and if there are any rules, everybody needs to know the rules. Learn from the books, but also if you can, bring some experienced people to your company. It shouldn't be one person, because that might be biased, but if you can get like two, three people that they already worked with microservices before, that would be much useful. I, I would have appreciated that a lot in this project. And of course, don't have the stigma there that, uh, oh, we shouldn't start with the monolith, we should start directly with microservices. You could just start with the, what people call a small monolith, so you can build at least the first implementation there, try to see how your domains are structured, just move classes around between the packages, make the packages represent your microservices, and then later you can extract them into microservices. But to start with, you can get rid of all the deployment and complexity that you will have from the beginning. And that's it. So uh, gracias. And if you have any question, just feel free to, to ask. That's my Twitter handle. Thank you so much for the talk. Uh, just today and just in this talk, uh, for the ones that will make a question from the audience, we receive some prize. So I already have here uh, in, the, uh, in the Google Docs that you have, by the way, on the uh, last page of the, of the batch. I have a couple of, que of questions, and uh, I'll ask who, ma who, who, made, who wrote it. So he or she will receive the uh, prize. Uh, so first question is, have you had a successful use case using microservices? Yeah. So I'm uh, working right now at uh, Jolt, which is uh, it's a kind of a spin-off of ING, the Dutch uh, bank. And actually there I'm liking a lot how we work with microservices. So we are doing event-driven and all. Uh, we are experimenting with some event sourcing. We are having synchronous calls here and there where we don't think that they are bottlenecks. So I've seen this working and quite nicely. And of course there are some people that they didn't work before with a monolith, and there is a group of people that would prefer the monolith, but I think that is because they don't know what the disadvantages would be of uh, coming back there. But I, I've seen a couple of uh, practical, uh, nice implementations, yeah. And whoever made the question can raise the hand, and was she, so. Yeah, okay, you can come later, come yeah. later for the uh, book. A second question is, do you think that this is possible to implement microservices with more than three or four teams in different locations? Uh, honestly, no, I don't think so. So of course you can, but, uh, but you shouldn't, I think, because it will be very difficult to have all these design sessions in which you have to see how to limit the boundaries and which functionality should go where because you cannot be 100% connected all the time with these people asking questions. So it's very, very difficult. Unless your domain has very strict boundaries in advance, so you cannot break those boundaries because they are actually functional ones. But yeah, I've seen not many projects uh, with that uh, setup. Yep. Okay, so please, the person then come here to receive the, the prize. Yeah, I have uh, up to three books, so I think that already two. Maybe one more question, a leaf question. Yeah, we can move the microphone there. Yeah. 
I can't see from here. But... Great presentation. Thank you for that. Um, so I was curious, what strategies have you used for schema evolution and uh, in particular for messaging between the various microservices? For this, uh, in this project, none. So we were not using any kind of schema evolution. Uh, so that was uh, mayhem, as, as you can imagine. But in the one that we are uh, right now, what we do is that we don't have a schema evolution. We actually want to uh, start experimenting with uh, Avro. But we haven't done yet because what we are doing so far is that we create different events and different API versions uh, every time we want to evolve the communication between services. It's a bit uh, cumbersome and it requires a bit more work. But uh, yeah, we are still pending of experimenting with, uh, with Avro, for instance. Great, thank you. No problem. I have a question as well. Um, yeah. I'll play the devil's advocate here, but uh, what is your opinion about the computational overhead of microservices and the coupling compared to an entangled monolith app? Is always worth it? Yeah, so the, the thing is that uh, I guess it depends on the money you have, right? Because it, it's, uh, it's funny, of course, the monolith can be optimized in a way that it consumes less resources, and nowadays with the cloud uh, resources is very important that you don't spend all your money on deploying microservices. But it's very easy because in this project actually happened that you are going to deploy 30 microservices and then you need like one cluster of I don't know how many machines uh, and that will cost uh, a lot of money. So if you can, you can optimize as you are evolving in your project. But if you already start with the budget restrictions and you go for microservices, then one of your top requirements should be try to use a virtual machine or some cloud native uh, executables that you can take advantage of. Yeah. And I have another question is uh, when you optimize microservices, sometimes uh, uh, lead to micro optimization, yeah. which sometimes is against good practices. Yeah. So, what's your opinion? Yeah, so you should do that only if you need to do that because you are limited by uh, budget again. I don't think that you should try to do this micro-optimization because, of course, with the events, it can happen the same thing. So you can be always designing so your services don't depend on each other and they can be deployed independently without deploying one before the other. But it's very easy to fall in this micro-optimization thing because you can live maybe one month with the constraint that you have to deploy service A before service B, or having one service that requires four gigs of uh, RAM. Yeah, it, it's fine to start with. You can optimize that later if you need it. And I have a couple of questions as well that they are similar. It's uh, in which cases would you advise to use monolithic instead of microservices? And the second one is why someone that went to microservices regret it and come back to monolith? OK, so for the first one, I would recommend starting with a monolith in all cases where you don't know yet how your microservices are going to uh, be defined. So in this case, like contracts, invoices, and users, maybe it's very easy to come up with that idea at first. But that doesn't mean that that's the best way of uh, making boxes of your microservices. So I would recommend that you start with a monolith in those cases where you don't know your domain boundaries, then you learn from the experience, you move classes between packages, and then later you extract this into microservices. And then the second question was it's about why the people regretting. why someone move to microservices, regret it, and come back to monolith. Yeah, so when you work with microservices, there are a lot of things that you have to learn. Like, for instance, if you want to uh, find out what was a problem in production and you have this distributed tracing mechanism. You have to go to your logs, then check for the trace ID and check what exactly happened in every service. And then you go to one service that is not within your control, let's say, and you don't know how that works. So you have to find some people from that team because you never saw that code. 
and that makes everything very slow in some cases because uh, either people are talking to each other in a very fluent way or in this case it can be very difficult to debug what exactly happened because you have a distributed system. Of course you can have as well race conditions that you wouldn't have with the monolith so it's of course uh, a more complicated system than a monolith one in my opinion. Okay, so I think it's, it's the end, so please give him a big applause. Thank you.